We are a baby church plant. I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, some of you know that. Some of you maybe rolled in uh, over the last few months. You, we might have fooled you. Probably not. Probably not. Um, but obviously, we're a young church. We had our first publicly kind of advertised gathering, if you will, the first Sunday of 2022. So uh, we're not even two years really kind of public. Uh, we did meet for over a year uh, leading up to that uh, and kind of slowly gathered a core team of, of people. But I say that to, to say this, uh, when you're a young church, you look for partnerships. You look for people to partner with you. And um, we, by God's grace, have, have had that happen for us. There's those who partner with us in prayer. I, I hope you know that there are people praying for you today. They might not know your names or your faces, but they're praying for you today in this church. They're praying for Mercy Village Church throughout the week. There are those who partnered with us in prayer. Uh, some of you have been partnered with us since day one or you know, day 60 or like from the earliest times. You chose to, to um, leave uh, some churches with their blessing that knew what they were doing to be a part of a church that had no idea what it was doing and, and be a part of it as it grew up. And, and so there's people who partnered with us in that way too. Others of you have, have come along throughout the journey and have partnered with us here in, in ministry and you serve alongside of us. Another way that people partner, though, is uh, just investing in the church. And, and one of the things you do as a young church plant is you look for, well, what we did was we looked for networks, networks of churches that we could come alongside of so that we could glean not only financial support from those networks, but also uh, learning opportunities, coaching. I have coaches that, that coach me throughout the year. I, I have meetings that I sit on. Uh, ongoing education opportunities, and, and then also renewal for pastors as they grow weary in the, in the fight. And one of our dear partners is the Harbor Network, and we, they are a, a non-denominational partnership of, of churches throughout the United States of America. And what they value above everything else is church health. That's what they want to help with, churches with, in particular their leaders. And I'm saying all this to say, not only are we thankful for the Harbor Network, but my wife and I were able to go to the first lead pastors and wives retreat that we'd ever been to as part of the network in Hilton Head, and they treated us well down there, we had to pay minimal amount of money to, to get there, and, and they, they treated us well. But while we were there, there's a, a pastor named Zach Eswine, I read a book by him, uh, years ago called The Imperfect Pastor. Could have been about me, right? The Imperfect Pastor. And uh, it touched my heart, but I never had the chance to hear him in person. He spoke at this retreat twice, and it should not be uh, ironic to you or, or a surprise to you that this series that we're in right now is going to have two parts, and I'm completely plagiarizing it from him. So I want to give credit where credit is due, so that it's not plagiarism, quite frankly. I've taken what we gleaned down there, because I sat there as he preached two sermons to us, and I was struck at how much I needed to hear what he said. It could have been just me in that room, talking and, and hearing him speak to me. Over the weeks that followed, though, I've thought how much all of us need to hear what he had to say. And so, just for full disclosure, what I'm doing the, the next two sermons I preach in this series that we're calling Held, Resting in the Loving Embrace of Our Heavenly Father, is I'm taking what He gave to us and I'm repackaging it for you. So uh, He did better, though. I just want you to know that going in, but I'm going to do, do my best. When He talked about Psalm 131, which is where we'll be today, Psalm 131, he talked to us about this show that he'd watched. I never have. It's called The Detectorist. It's about two metal guys who do metal detecting. Two middle-aged men. And in the show, it sounds, doesn't sound very interesting, but it's evidently an interesting show. It's had multiple seasons. They go around the countryside with their metal detectors seeking treasure. They seek to find it. And uh, it follows them and their relationships and this community of people who who do metal detecting, that's their thing. 
But what struck me was not the show itself, but the quote of one of the writers, one of the writers said uh, of the show in an interview said, uh, I think the show speaks to people because all of us want our life to be golden somehow. We're all seeking a golden life. We might not call it that. We might call it something else. But we have desires and dreams and hopes and expectations that life will be golden. And what's really baffling is, is that when Jesus comes on the scene, he talks about what it's like for life to be golden, the most golden that it can possibly be. It's called the kingdom. When he talks about the kingdom of God, what he says over and over and over again is that to have a golden life, to have a kingdom life, you have to enter a place of childlike dependence. You have to become like a child. Remember Matthew 18, at that time the disciples came to Jesus. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, they asked. Who's the most golden? We want to know. Is it me, Peter? I walked on water, right? I must be golden. I've performed well. Mothers, who's the greatest? The kingdom, who's the most golden? And Jesus, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you enter into a space of childlike dependence, you'll never be golden. And I think it's interesting, and the Roman world around him would have thought the same thing. They would have mocked this idea. You don't get power by being like a child. That's foolishness. Jesus wasn't holding out the Romans' message. He was holding out God's message. Childlike dependence is the way to be golden. Today, for some of us, that may sound peaceful. Oh, to just be like a child. To have the peace of, of that dependence and being held and cared for by our parents. For others, it may cause you anxiety. Maybe your childhood experience wasn't ideal. Maybe uh, it was the opposite. Maybe you had to grow up too fast. Maybe the thought of being a child just fills you with anxiety because of all the memories you have from the past. But regardless, anywhere you land on that spectrum... Even those who had the most incredible childhood, I think that, that the idea, if we're honest with ourselves, still sounds a little bit ridiculous that we, would, that we would enter a place of childlike dependence to be carried by our Father. Striving no longer, resting in His arms. You see, we often do the opposite. To be golden, we avoid the place of childlike dependence. And we work our tails off to be golden. We do it in the world, the kingdoms of the world, our workplaces, our own families. We strive to make ourselves golden, and we do it in, this, in the church, too, in the kingdom. Striving to be golden for God. To earn the love that has already been freely given. Striving to be, be golden. That's where Psalm 31, 131 comes in so handy for us today. It mentors us. Before the son of David, Jesus ever took a child and put him in the midst of his disciples. David models being a child for us. And mentors us and what it looks like to enter into a space of childlike dependence for the Lord as the only way to be golden, or better yet, as true children of God to realize that we already are golden. That He sees us that way already. Every true child of God is held by the Father when we feel like it and when we don't. Our Father always gives us Himself, all that we need, 
So might we embrace childlike dependence before our Father. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In particular, a deep awareness for the true children of God in this room that you are holding us right now, regardless of how golden we are by the world's standards. That we are beloved and we are held. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Verse 1 of Psalm 131 reminds us, don't occupy yourself with being golden. Listen to what David says. He says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. That word occupy has to do with this idea of meddling in Uh, making oneself busy with. He he says, I will not meddle with or even entertain an inward conversation with these things. And the things that he says are being lifted up, having his eyes raised up, things that are great and marvelous. He says, I'm not going to even meddle with striving to be golden. That's what he says. As the world around me strives to make themselves golden, I I will not. You see, for David, there were things outside of him that could have increased his status, could have increased his wealth, could have increased his power. He was the king of Israel at the time, a great nation. He had a lot, but he could have had more. He could have leveraged his power and increased his notoriety and increased his platform very easily. He had it there for him. And they were all there, these things outside of himself that he could have lifted his eyes to and put his hope in and strived and and desired for, but he contrasts that with his inner self. Contrast these things outside of him with what's inside of him, his heart. He says, my heart and myself. He says, I am choosing to not occupy myself with these outside things. How strange for a king, a military ruler, to stand up before his nation and say, I'm not going to strive to be golden. I'm not going to strive for power. I'm not going to strive for control. I'm I'm not going to occupy myself with these things. Imagine, right, in this presidential debates that are up and coming, we're going to have our fill of them over the next couple years. If the presidential candidate stood up there and, and said, you know what is the way? Childlikeness. Humility, patience, peacefulness. Can you, you can't even fathom it. You can't, not in our world. Imagine a 2023 American of any variety, including your own self and the people sitting up and down these rows saying that about their lives. Ooh, there's opportunity here. But for me to pursue that will mean I have to leave this childlike place of dependence on the Lord, and so I'm not going to do it. Can you imagine? It's not like us to do that. It's very, very strange. And, and David, though, he doesn't just say it. He writes a song about it. And you know this about the Psalms, maybe. The entire nation of Israel is going to sing this together. They're going to gather and they're going to sing as a nation that being like a child, soldiers will sing this, kings will sing this, princes will sing this, that being like a child is the way to be golden. That's what they'll sing about. We have objections already maybe forming in our own minds about this. The first is just why? Like, David, why? You, you, you could have more, David. You could have more. Better yet, you're God's chosen one. You could have more for God. We'll justify that in our lives, won't we? You have more for the kingdom. Live the momentum, David. You only live once. And all these opportunities are there. There's a show my wife and I started watching. It's called Trying. It's on Apple TV. And so far, it's interesting. I was told of a scene later in the show, we haven't seen it yet, of... uh, of one of the characters who's not very kind, he's, he's kind of uh, maybe manipulative, seeking power, and he's, he's kind of a jerk. 
And he's seeking to humble himself to kind of come to a, a place of a fully integrated life, like a, like a whole life that is, you know, good and restful. And uh, he ne- decides he needs a support group. So he starts his own version of AA. And you'll have to forgive me, you might not have expected to hear this at church today, but it's AA meaning A-Holes Anonymous. That's what it is. It's the group he starts and Slowly it grows larger, and, and they come and, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm an a-hole, I've been an a-hole for however long. Um, here's the evidence of that. And till one day, one of the ladies stands up in the middle of the thing. She's a powerful, successful person. She says, listen, this is stupid. She goes, we've been kicking butt and taking names And we haven't cared what anybody has to say about it or who gets in our way. And look what it's gotten us. It's gotten us wealth or it's gotten us power and it's gotten us control. Why in the world would we apologize for that? Why in the world would we stop it? And she storms out of the meeting. And one by one, everybody else does too. And so the guy who started the group is left there by himself, desiring to be humble Desiring to find a fully integrated life, and everybody around him is saying, why? You can get what you want, or you can be childlike. That would be an objection we would, would put forward. David, why would you let go when you could grab more? The ancient Christians understood this. This is how you can kind of know this was the philosophy of the Roman world at the time, why this would have all been so ridiculous for believers to lay hold of. 1 Corinthians 15.32, the last part of it, uh, it says this, if the dead are not raised, in other words, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, if Christianity is a farce, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Right? Like if the gospel isn't real, then why not? Right? Just keep being a non-attending member of A-Holes Anonymous. Keep getting yours. That would be an objection we would put forth. Another would be this. Maybe, maybe David just has a self-esteem problem, right? Like, maybe that's what it is. And there's something important there in our society today. I, I, I don't want to demean that. There are those in this room, there are those in this world who, who don't understand their dignity for whatever reasons in their life. They don't know what God says about them to be true that they are beloved by God, that they are known by God, and they are seen by God, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made. And and so I don't make light of that. That's important. Self-esteem in the biblical sense matters, that we know who we are in Christ. There are ways that self-esteem can be kind of uh, turned maybe into non-biblical and non-godly ways, but there is a sense, a real sense, in which we should know who we are, in Christ, and we should rest in who we are in Christ. But David doesn't have a self-esteem problem. I'll tell you why. I mean, this is a man who, who, uh, who was before Goliath, the giant. Remember this one? And the king says, here's some armor. And he says, ah, no thanks. I don't need it. So he goes out there like in his tunic with five rocks, and he gets in front of the giant, and he slings the stone at him, and he knocks him on the ground. Then he pulls out the sword. This is like probably in his teen years. Chops off his head holds it up over him and says, come on, we're going to win the battle, right? Like, this is, this is the guy. He's not having self-esteem issues. You remember this one? Here's another church story for you you're not expecting to hear. They bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. It's been out of the country. It's, the enemies have had it for a, for a time. And, and the day that they bring it back is a day of celebration. And, and David is so excited that he uh, is nearly naked, possibly completely naked, dancing in front of the Ark of the covenant for everyone to see as he rejoices before the Lord. This guy doesn't have self-esteem problems. This is the true posture of his heart. He, he, he's not, woe is me. He's, he's choosing to forsake these things because he knows there's a better way. Another objection some might have is, hey, David has everything he needs. It's easy for him to say that. He's got all the power, he's got all the control, he's got all the wealth. Of course he can say, I'm not going to get any more. He already has enough. Maybe. But if that's true, why don't more people with power and wealth 
and control say it? Why are more of the powerful not saying things like this, if that were true? Truth is, it's never easy to say, right? Remember Jim Carrey, that famous quote? I mean, I think it made its rounds. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can know that's not the answer. There's other famous rich people who have said similar things. And the reason that sounds so strange is because we're brought up to believe by the society around us because we don't hear very many voices saying that, even the powerful and the rich and the wealthy. We could go on with our objections, but the truth of the matter is David had no reason or or no uh, reason in this world to talk like he does in verse 1, but he chooses to. So why? Why risk it? Why risk saying, I don't want to chase after power anymore. I don't want to chase after wealth. I don't want to chase after these lofty things. Well, it's because he... He desires true happiness, true peace, a contented inner life. Look at the poetry of verse 2. Don't occupy yourself with being golden. Verse 1, verse 2 says, occupy yourself with being a child. He says, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. He says it twice, the weaned child. Whether you've had kids or haven't, if you've been close to a baby, in their earliest stages, you have met what is not a weaned child. I don't know if you know this about a baby, but they need to eat. So they do, bottle or nursed or however, and they receive that meal. And two to three hours later, they need to eat again. Cognitively, they have zero clue where that next meal is coming from. They don't know. How could they possibly have figured that out yet? They're a brand new baby. They don't speak English. Not yet. That's important to remember. So they scream out for their lives. As if they will die. If left there, they will die. So the unweaned child screams out, for their life. It takes time. Gradually, the baby can lay there in its crib and look at its watch. Say, well, it's been a few hours. Nobody's coming. But they've always come before. So I can wait. That's the weaned child. David's learning to be peaceful and content. David's learning that the presence of his father is enough. David's learning that the provision of his father is enough, even when it doesn't feel like it. Like a weaned child. He applies the image of a baby to himself. The king of the nation the military ruler compares himself to a, to a baby. Would you want to follow a leader like that? It's worth asking. Who values humility more than power? Who values childlikeness more than control? Zach Eswine, the pastor who we heard share this passage at the Harbor Network, retreat, told us about his son Noah. Noah's four years old. They, with him every night, they've been telling him, um, Noah, you're a loved boy. You're loved by God. You're loved by your parents, loved by your family. You're a loved boy. That's just, sometimes it's just the shorthand. You're, you're a loved boy. Noah, you're a loved boy. Zach said that Noah's now the spiritual director of the family because the other night he said, they said, uh, Noah, you're a loved boy. And he looked right back at his dad and he said, yes, I am. The wean child knows the love of the father. 
You're a loved child. Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, he had some cousins come over. One of them said to Noah, said, Noah, you're a little boy. He said, no, I'm not. I'm a loved boy. The weaned child knows the voice of the father matters more than the voice of the cousins. You're a loved child. Can we say that before God? Can, can we hear him say, for God so loved the world, we can say, yes, that's me. Loved. Loved by God. That's the weaned child. And, and, and I'm sitting there listening to him tell this story, and I'm like, okay, yes, so we're weaned. And then he says, but when Noah gets out to Thomas, the train tracks. Four years old. He's weaned when it comes to milk and food. But when Thomas the train is there, going around on the tracks, and the tracks break, or Noah's trying to put the tracks together and he can't, Noah's not weaned there. He still cries out, screams. Who's going to fix these tracks? You know, it's like he's not weaned when it comes to the broken Tracks, let the hearer understand, right? Have you stood before the broken tracks in your life before? You were weaned, you, you know that you're loved, but then the marriage derails. I love you guys so much. The diagnosis comes. The opportunity you thought was, was there for the taking dissolves in front of you. The, the pain that you wish would heal or the, or the anxiety that you wish would go away just, just keeps pounding away at you and you stand there in front of the fractured tracks And you're just not sure anymore. You knew you were loved, but now you don't. We've all stood before the broken tracks. Maybe you're standing in front of them right now. You see, we're all still being weaned to know the love of our Father. And by the broken tracks, we think, why in the world am I still doing this? We get like the woman at A-Holes Anonymous. We, we want to stand up and be like, forget this. If it is so stinking difficult to learn that I'm loved, if I have to come back again and again and again to learn this lesson, I'm just going to go get mine. I'm going to go do it my way. We don't want anything to do with this, and we're tempted to, to walk away, to, to be on our, our way. I heard a pastor share about his anxiety, which was very vulnerable and kind of him to share this story. He said, he said anxiety sometimes will grip him, and his wife has learned to see the signs. He'll go palms up. He'll be sitting on the couch or sitting at the table and he'll go palms up when the anxiety hits. She'll ask him, are you okay? And he'll say, I just feel it coming on. And his wife will... <laughs> she'll walk over to him and she'll put her forehead against his and she'll put his hand, her hand on the back of his neck and she'll say, you're a child of the king. You're safe here. You're loved. That's what David does in verse 3. He himself has experienced the fractured tracks of Thomas the train. He knows the pain. He has 
struggled with what it is to be weaned. He's still struggling with what it is to be weaned. But even in his own struggle to enter into the childlike space, he, he turns. He's been saying things inward in verses 1 and 2. Oh, Lord, my heart. He's having a conversation with himself and with God. Now he says, oh, Israel. He turns outward, oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. David goes forehead to forehead with the people of God. He puts his hand on the back of their neck. He enters into that barren place. He says, hey, I've wrestled this too. But will you join me in hoping in the Lord? Remember the broken Thomas, the train tracks, the little Noah? Pastor Zach said, hey, when I told you about Noah with the tracks, you just probably felt like the camera was zoomed in on him and his face, his pain, his sorrow. But if the camera would pull back, you would see. He was sitting in his father's lap the whole time. Hey, <laughs> didn't feel like it, didn't change the reality. He didn't feel held. He felt his world collapsing around him. He was held the whole time. We could take notes, Noah has learned uh, recently that the tracks broke and Noah started to cry. And then he said, it's okay. We can fix it. He's learning to be weaned. I hate to tell you this, which you already know, though. As soon as he gets weaned on Thomas the train, it'll be something else. And it'll still be happening in his 20s and in his 30s and in his 40s and in his 50s. We're all in the process of being weaned to trust the love of our Father. That's why the old timers gave us this differentiation between faith and assurance of faith. Faith saves us. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Put your faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross to forgive sinners like you and sinners like me, and you will be saved. Faith. Some days, you don't feel like it anymore. I'm doubting the Lord. He's still holding you. If you are a true child of God today, no matter how much faith you have in Him now, He is still holding you now. Uh, when the Israelites came out of uh, Egypt, I heard a pastor share this one time. He said, imagine two of the men, you know, the, the one with his family, the night before they uh, call everyone together and they say, paint the blood on the doorpost. Because tonight the Lord is going to set us free, He's going to pass over, and, and if there's no blood on the doorpost, then the firstborn in every family will die. So the one man, he goes, he opens the Torah with his family, they pray these great prayers of faith, they walk through all the ritual of it, they put the blood on the doorpost, and, and they are just earnest in their actions. Ned, down the street, man, he got home late from work. Didn't have a sheep, right? So he's got to go get one. And they kill it, and the clock's ticking, and the kids are screaming, and he's just not really feeling it. And he goes out, and he puts the blood on the doorpost. And the next day, whose son was still alive? Both of them. You see, it's... The object of your faith that we, means way more than the intensity of your faith. 
David longed for his people to know this and understand this. And so he says, oh, you hear the passion? Oh, a heartfelt expression of longing to be content in the arms of God and for the people of God to be content there as well. And in that, a willingness to forgo desiring great things for the better greatness entering into the childlike space. Trusting Him to hold Him. Reminding Him of who He already is. Golden. When Jesus died on the cross, He took up the cause of everything that makes that invitation sound scary. The reasons of your past, the people that have hurt you, the the people that have lied to you, the people who should have encouraged you into childlike dependence and instead did the opposite to you. Jesus took up the cause of the child who cries out when he's abandoned, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows that pain. He knows that fear. But then he sets the example at that very moment after he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does he then say? He says, now into your hands I commit my spirit. He sets the example of what it is, even in fear and darkness and pain, to trust the one Father who is worthy, infinitely worthy of trust. So, we follow his example. We look to him who says, I will trust my Father. Sometimes we question the safety of giving ourselves over to the Father. But in Christ, in the arms of Christ, we learn to become weaned. Because Jesus is faithful again and again and again. It's time. (laughs) I don't see anybody coming. Maybe it's been a year and you still don't see anybody coming. Maybe infertility or whatever it is. Don't see anybody coming. Lord, help me to wait. Help me to trust your love. I give us a couple questions to think this through. Three questions. They're on, uh, well, are you seeing the whole picture? This would be the first. They're a little bit different than the ones on the back of your worship God. Are you seeing the whole picture? Here's what I mean. You can see the fractured tracks. They they present themselves pretty easily. Maybe you even think about that in this moment, what the fractured tracks of your life are right now. And they're blatantly obvious, but maybe more important, where is God reminding you that you're held? And are you seeing that just as clearly? See, it doesn't mean we close our eyes to the broken tracks. Reality is there and there and no... There's nothing in this book that would ever think that we need to pretend like pain and suffering and harshness in reality isn't there. It's not to look away and pretend that it doesn't exist. But the call of Scripture is to be able to also hold on to the realities of the promises of God that even in the midst of the pain, you're held. Sometimes we can see the broken tracks and it makes sense that we can. But we struggle to see the reminders that we are held. Are you seeing the whole picture? What are the ways recently, small or large, that you've seen from God that you're held? Two, how can you enter into that space of childlike dependence this week? How can you choose it this week? What can you say no to this week? What pursuits are distracting you into further attachment disorder between you and your Father? What things could you say no to that are eating away the margin of your life, eating away the joy of your life, that are actually causing you to struggle to feel attached to your Father even though He's been holding you the whole time? And what things can you say yes to? What practices help you zoom out and know that your Father's been holding you the whole time? What ways... Not just, the, not just reading your Bible, although that's one of them, but like, I have a friend that last week was sharing with me um, 
Like in a moment of struggle, he just looked up into the sky. Imagine the gaze of his father. And then he's being held. And and it stuck with me. Multiple times since that conversation, I've, I've done the same. It took about five seconds, just a little practice. <laughs> what things are you doing to remind you that you're held by the Father? And then lastly, how can you invite others to hope in the reality that they are held by the Father? Where can you show up in someone's life as your authentic, transforming self? Where can you show up as a child? who's learning to be weaned and place your forehead against someone else's forehead and put your hand on the back of their neck, metaphorically or literally, maybe. Don't be weird, but... And invite them to hope in the steadfast and unfailing love of the Father. If you're not a Christian, I'd love to talk to you about that today. Please don't leave without having that conversation. You can enter into the love of the Father. He says, uh, believe... As many as receive Him, who believe in Him, they can become children of God. That's John 1.12. What's great is up on the screens, you see how butchered I was quoting it, but the reality is this. Through faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, you today can be a child of God, loved by Him, learning to be weaned and trust that He's holding you the whole time. Every true child of God is held by the Father when we feel like it and when we don't. Our Father always gives us Himself. All that we need. So might we embrace childlike dependence before the Father. Before we celebrate communion, I'm going to pray, but then we'll take two minutes to just sit. There's uh, questions that will be up on the screen. They're on the back of your worship guide. And then we'll finish our gathering with communion. But don't waste these moments. Maybe you just need to sit there and remember that you're held by the Father. God, thank you so much that we're held when we feel like it and when we don't. Might your people feel it today, that you're holding them. And might that make all the difference. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.